thank you all very much for coming. And I'm sorry about the time changes, which have caused a lot of confusion. Maybe some more people will join us as we go along. So we'll, we'll plunge in, because I think we need to be out of here at a certain time. Um, David, um, I was not able to hear the introduction to you, so I will possibly repeat uh, and say that you've had a remarkably versatile career as a historian because you wrote two award-winning, prize-winning biographies, Curzon and Rudyard Kipling, and you then wrote, you've written histories on Italy, Spain, and uh, the Middle East. And of course, your last major book on India was the, the ruling caste about the ICS and uh, the kind of incorruptible, very dedicated service they offered. How far has this book, The British in India, which is quite a, I'm sorry, we should have a copy here, but we don't, uh, quite a monumental book. I mean, how did this grow out of the previous one on the ICS? Um, yes, well, ind indirectly it did, certainly, because uh, studying the ICS uh, made me uh, look at uh, Britons who came to India not just as viceroys and, and generals and, and, and uh, 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 exalted people like that. But, of course, the ICS, ICS itself is a very elite group, 1,100 uh, men, less than 1% of the, the, the population of, 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 of British India. Um, and then after that, I wanted to go you know, deeper, a bit wider, and look at the lives of uh, other people, like um, you know, uh, uh, foresters in Kumaon, or, or, or uh, engineers working on the canals. But I, but I also got um, particularly interested, and rather unexpectedly, about the amount of British people who came to India um, as it were, unintentionally, and uh, not exactly, they, they didn't plan to. People often think that uh, you know, every Briton came to India uh, to conquer it, to govern it, uh, or to exploit it financially. Uh, and of course, many did, no, no getting away from it. But most of them did not. It, it's interesting, I, I think a majority of British people found themselves here without having intended to be so. And that's, and that's true of most women. Um, you know, many of whom uh, married officers and officials on leave. Uh, it, it was obviously true of their children. Uh, George Orwell, Rudyard Kipling, uh, William Makepeace Thackeray didn't choose to be born in India. But I think it was also true of, of uh, uh, interesting enough, of most men. Because the maximum British population of India at any one time, except during the World War and the two World Wars, uh, the maximum population was 155,000 people. And nearly half of those people were um, soldiers of British Army regiments. And obviously when some Kipling's Tommy Atkins uh, enlists in Yorkshire or Lancashire or wherever he is, he doesn't know he's going to be sent to India. I mean, he might have been Canada or, or Australia or, or, or the West Indies or Dublin. Um, so he, they are also people who didn't expect to come here. And um, so th this book is quite largely about such people, not, not exactly marginal people, but uh, as it were, accidental um, appearance. Indeed, like the title of this talk, uh, Little People of the Empire. Now, um, you've said at several points in the book that you set out to write a social history not a political history, and you have very clearly not engaged with the kind of uh, political arguments, whether empire was good or bad, or with the kind of what I call terrorism, uh, which is to see empires being some sort of monstrosity. Um, do you think, uh, do, you, do you regret that, or do you think you were right to steer away from that argument? Uh, no, I, I, I don't regret it at all. It was a very, very conscious choice. Uh, there, there are all sorts of different types of history, the, uh, cultural history, military history, economic history, all things, subjects that can be studied you know, by themselves. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, political writing about, uh, about the history of the Raj. I didn't want to add to it. And there has been no social history uh, of, of the British in India. 
and I did want to write that, uh, about, like, about the sort of little people I, I, I talked about. I mean, to me, history is a case of you, you go to the archives, you, you study the documents, you look at uh, uh, the letters, the diaries, the reports, everything you can find uh, about your subject. Then you go home and think about it, and then you, you write the book. And the, it seems to me the job of the historian is to study the past and find out what happened. It's not about indulging in debates. I don't think history is a good subject for debate. It leads to generalizations, simplifications. Uh, anyway, it's, it's not my type of history. Now, you, uh, I think, very sensibly don't take on Shashi Tharoor and those sorts of uh, unhistorical arguments, but you do explicitly reject the ideological stereotypes of the Edward Said school of history. And um, how important was it for you to redress that balance and offer a different perspective from Edward Said? Well, uh, a, different, a different perspective, certainly. I'm not, not so much redressing the balance, but writing about people as, as, uh, uh, as individuals, as human beings, and not as parts of groups or, 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 or categories. I mean, uh, I, I knew Edward Said quite well. I, I, I liked him and, and admired him in many ways, but though not as a, not as a historian. For him, it was, it, it was very easy. You were either a, a, a colonialist and oppressor, or you were a victim, and the, the, all those gradations of people in between got, uh, got left out. I mean, he once wrote um, that uh, an Irishman could be no more like an Englishman than a Cambodian could be like a Frenchman, i.e. they're both 100% you know, victims. And, and this is real, really nonsense. It, it, it excludes all those Irishmen, uh, many of them who were half English anyway, um, and who actually uh, identify with both England and Britain and, and Ireland. So, so yes, so uh, it is a bit of a redressing the balance. And of course, uh, one illustration of that paradox was Sir Michael O'Dwyer, who was governor of the Punjab during the Jallianwala massacre and is widely held to be more responsible for repression than General Dyer. And he was a Catholic Irishman from somewhere in Tipperary from a very modest family, wasn't he? Yes, he was one of 14 children, Catholic children from a, from a poor farm. He got a scholarship uh, to Balliol, got into the I Oxford and got into the ICS. Uh, yes, well, he wasn't obviously responsible for the massacre, but he was responsible, for, but he supported it afterwards and he was responsible for um, uh, the re repressive policies of, of the time. But he's a very good example of, of of an Irishman who became, maybe we could say, the worst type of Englishman. Now, you say that you uh, wanted to work outwards from people's letters, uh, diaries, the sort of papers from the archives. Uh, presumably, it's been pretty hard work. And uh, how many years has this been in the making? Well, as you said, it's a very long book. I mean, maybe four or five years directly on this book. But of course, I, I had done and quite a lot of the research for it comes from things I'd done before, from when I, I, when I was doing uh, George Curzon's biography. I, I got very interested in the administration of India then. So maybe I've gone back 30 years in some ways. But I don't regard it as a, as a penance. I mean, to me, as a historian, the archive of research is the most in, enjoyable part of it. And there's, there's, there's nothing more fun, I think, than um, I love it when you, you find yourself sitting next to somebody at a dinner and they say, oh, um, my grandfather was political agent in Manipur, and, uh, and I got a trunk of his letters in the attic. I, I find that very exciting. Now, you have a panoramic cast of characters. It ranges across grand viceroys, randy subalterns, conscientious judges, district officers, memesahibs, prostitutes, racist planters, pig-sticking cavalry officers. Are there certain common traits that emerge? You know, for instance, uh, a determination and stoicism, which we rightly or wrongly associate with the British stiff upper lip. Oh, the stiff upper lip, yes. Well, well, well stoicism and the stiff upper lip you know, were part of the ethos of the British public schools, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the 19th century. So I think at the higher levels of the army and administration, you would find it a, a lot there. Um, I wouldn't think that uh, 
British sergeants or, or ordinary soldiers were um, much interested in the stiff upper lip, and they didn't behave as if they were. Uh, I think what, what they might have had in common was probably a self-confidence. And I think you know, the, the knowledge that you came from two small islands in the Atlantic and that you find yourself in charge of this enormous empire in every continent, yeah, well, I, I expect that would give one self-confidence. Um, now, uh, I think um, life was pretty hard for the average British person in India who wasn't in the upper echelons. But, you know, there's this uh, 17th century saying you mentioned about uh, the uh, sort of British um, here in India had two monsoons are the age of man. And a lot of people died very young, uh, got all sorts of tropical diseases, had to live in pretty harsh climates in the Mufasa, in very remote areas. So uh, was life pretty hard, rather than the idea that the British had a very cushy life in India? Yes, well, certainly in, in the 17th and 18th centuries, when the, the mortality rate was, was huge, I mean, most most Britons who came to India never, never saw Britain again. Um, and something like three quarters or 80% of, of the army officers of the East India Company in the 18th century uh, never went back, went back to Britain. But these hardships, uh, climate and, and uh, tropical diseases, um, they affected the, 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 the top of the Raj as well. And then there quite a few governors and their wives died of cholera and malaria. And of course, their children did too. I mean, General Roberts, uh, uh, the famous General Roberts, who was um, commander in chief here, I mean, he lost th his three children uh, to, to, to illnesses here. Uh, yes, um, the, the life of the, say, the, you know, the British soldier, it was quite tough, especially in the hot weather when they had nothing to do. But boredom was the problem there. Mm. And some of these hardships, they, well, they brought about themselves. You know, the thing about them is that they were, they were paid well enough that they could get drunk very often. Um, and they were also, that money also meant that they could go to the bazaars and find prostitutes. And the result is that they were, they were, they were often very ill and they often got venereal disease. And the, 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 the rates of venereal infection in the 1880s was absolutely enormous. You, you could find something like 40, 45% of, of a regiment completely laid out with it. Um, that's fascinating because, of course, there is this image of the British colonial in India living very exclusive lives in clubs and playing polo and going out and killing lots of animals yes, on this, this is This is a quite a small group of people at the, at the top. Right. But even they would die. Even the, they had a high mortality. They were rate. not immune from venereal disease and alcoholism and so on. But um, uh, w one of the things that struck me reading your book was that what came across uh, almost throughout the uh, British in India was a very strong sense of duty, a feeling that however hard conditions were, they were there to do a job. And the job was not necessarily to get rich and um, you know, exploit the natives. It was actually to make a difference to improve lives. I mean, was there a quite a sort of strong ethic of actually helping people? I think in different periods there was. I think not in the 18th century, uh, uh, hardly ever. The, 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 the writer Horace Walpole said that uh, uh, nobody went to the India no Englishman went to India with good intentions, which meant he, he, that, they, that they went out to make money, often unscrupulously. Uh, it, it, I think at the beginning of the 19th century, altruism was playing uh, a big part, uh, but not, as, uh, not a majority. There, and then there were two strains of altruists then. There was the, 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 the religious, the, the evangelical movement and the missionaries, and the evangelicals well, they were very. They were in the forefront of the campaigns against sati and and female infanticide. The missionaries were more interested in 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 converting people, at least at the beginning. And later on, they did useful work as, as perhaps as teachers and in, and in the missionary hospitals. But to begin with, they're, they're almost a 
unique aim was to make converts. And they, you know, they, with a complete lack of success. I mean, they, they, their strike rate was unbelievably low. Sometimes you, you find a missionary who spent 25 years in India and has made one or two converts, who then might revert after his death. Uh, the other strain of, of, of uh, um, altruism w w was secular. And it, I think it was summed up by Rudyard Kipling when he said, the job of the British in India is to save bodies and leave souls alone. And I think that was um, the creed of the ICS and of, on, 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 of the administration. And many of the services, the people were building canals. And there was a remarkable Victorian engineer called uh, Arthur, Arthur Cotton, I mean, who literally dedicated his entire life. Uh, every morning he got up, he, what can I do to help the Indian peasantry? And it was, in his case, it was building canals, irrigating the land. And often these people get, get, get forgotten later on. I knew that the government of Andhra Pradesh in the 1980s had erected a statue to him. But what I hadn't realized until uh, the historian Manu Pele told me yesterday or the day before, apparently in the villages of Andhra Pradesh, there are 3,000 statues to Arthur Cotton. Um, and uh, so there was, there was that, that, was that uh, strain of altruism, more practical, one might say, than the missionaries. Yes, I mean, I uh, grew up with um, uh, a Muslim bearer, they were called bearers, uh, mm. sort of butler, who had worked for an ICS officer, Sir Tennant Sloan. I don't know if he cropped Sorry, up in. I didn't hear that. Uh, he worked for an ICS yes. officer called Sir Tennant Sloan. Oh, yes. And uh, he, Sir Tennant wrote to him regularly once a month, and I used to have to read out and translate the letters into um, Hindustani. And, but it was amazing, and he used to send him money orders. He remembered him, uh, his and his children's birthdays. So there was this quite close bond with a servant, which is quite contrary to you know, the kind of stories that say someone like Shashi Tharoor uh, will kind of trumpet about uh, how the British used to kick their servants in the stomach and they died of their injuries. I think there was one case on the basis of which um, all the British were sort of slammed for kind of attacking their servants. Uh, I mean, di did you come across this kind of stereotype? Yes, but also, yes, but there, there are instances of, of, of deaths, but also there are instances of the, of the kindnesses uh, uh, you come across, of people paying pensions and mm. wedding expenses long after they've left India. And I think the nicest one was uh, of Clement Attlee's bearer. You know, Attlee uh, came out uh, for the, uh, in, 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 in doing the, the Simon Report in 1929 and had a bearer then. And they got on so well that Attlee never came back to India, uh, of course, he's a very important figure in, in, in the Indian independence, but, but he never came back. And yet, um, uh, after his death, uh, the bearer was still paying uh, uh, an annual mass on the day of his death in, in I think, Madras. I mean, also, uh, reading your book, one, one of the things that came across was the enormous job satisfaction that a British uh, officer could have, for instance, a medical officer who had inoculated a whole village, or an engineer who had built a canal that, uh, you know, irrigated hundreds of acres. So at the end of the day or at the end of the month, they could really feel they'd achieved quite a substantial amount, couldn't they? Yes, on a, uh, well, some. I mean, yes, I mean, in, in, the, in, in those cases, and like this man, Arthur Cotton, you could, especially when you see something tangible, like oil or canals there, or in the Punjab, then you, then you would have a, uh, yes, you could get some satisfaction. So there was a sort of huge, I mean, uh, one of the sort of plus sides, I mean, if you lived in very difficult conditions in, in sort of, un inhospitable areas climatically, but you, you had a tremendous job satisfaction if you could really achieve a difference in the lives of the people around you. Yes, and it, it, was, a, it was a terrific challenge. And when we're going back to the thing of, of, of self-confidence. Um, you know, if you'd passed the ICS exam and you came out here and you were sent to as an assistant magistrate, 
I mean, you might be actually in charge of uh, an area the size of an English county, populated by a million people. Uh, um, and I think that the job satisfaction was enormous. Of course, there was a huge backup, a huge bureaucracy of, of, of uh, Indian tasseldars and deputy collectors uh, to help him. Uh, mm. Yes, the, the, but you, when you read their diaries, you, you do feel, I'm glad I'm a civil servant in India. I'm not just stuck in London commuting on the train every morning. Uh, uh, um, I, I, I can make, mm. do some practical good. Uh, how much good it was. But that's a debatable, but certainly uh, they felt they were. But I mean, on uh, things like, you know, female infanticide, child marriage, um, sati, um, how much impact do you think, how much reforming impact do you think British officials actually had on the ground? I, I think in reforming society, quite a limited amount. One must remember that the East India Company was so terrified of you know, provoking disturbances, uh, provoking the Muslim and, in, and uh, Hindu communities, that they wouldn't allow missionaries into this country throughout the 18th century. And they only let them in uh, because Parliament and Britain forced them to let them in in 1813. But even so, the, the administration was always very cautious uh, about this, you know, possibly especially after 1857, they don't want that again. So you, I, 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 I think they were, they were um, maybe raising the age of consent by a year or eventually allowing Hindu widows to remarry. That, that sort of thing, but not much. I think they had a bigger impact, which is not individual, but a bigger impact on the institutions, on, on the, the, the law courts, the, the free press, the, the universities, where, where many of, of India's future leaders were, were, were educated. And I think the atmosphere that, the, that they created uh, does definitely, from that, does help the stem uh, the Indians' their own uh, making of the liberal secular democracy, which, which they, they eventually made. It wasn't something the British taught them, it, but it's something that matured through these institutions. Now, you, your book does dispel a lot of the negative stereotypes peddled by the Said school of anti-Orientalism. And one of those, uh, which you do explode very convincingly, is the idea that the Maim Sahib, who was so widely blamed for ending male British attachment to Indian Bibis, you point out that she was herself the victim of crippling loneliness, outnumbered 7,000 to one. Uh, and it's not surprising, you write, that they sometimes felt lonely, scared, beleaguered, and rather cross. And why do you think Mem Sahibs have got such a bad press? Well, well Mem Sahibs did get rid of the BBs. I mean, the, the, to, to, to them, uh, the BB was not only a sexual competitor, but, but uh, um, a moral affront. And you know, we're talking now into the beginning in the, in the Victorian period. Um, but the bad press, well, one, in a way one can date some of it from E.M. Forster's book, A Passage to India, because he, he caricatured them as, as Mrs. Turton and Mrs. Mrs. Callender. But of course, there were many, there must have been many like them. And he met, he met two on the boat coming out and he heard them talking and he thought these were the most awful people he'd come across. Uh, but obviously there were memsabs who were snobbish, racist, um, and uh, standoffish and insufferable. Uh, but there were quite a lot who were not. Uh, I mean, there were, I came across a lot of women in my research who didn't want to go to the club, who didn't want to play bridge. Um, uh, and, uh, and who actually wanted to get to know India uh, and uh, wanted to travel about India. Quite a lot of people, you know, they studied Indian languages and they would have liked, many of them would have liked to make Indian friends. And, but that, the fact that they didn't wasn't really their problem. It was, they, you couldn't make friends with Indian women in Purdah. Uh, and, and until a few of them came out of Perda towards the end of the Raj, that was, that was a, and that was one of the main factors that separated the races. Uh, but and the problem about the, the, the Memsabs is that they, 
didn't have enough to do. And they came out uh, as wives. From, from, from the 17th century, they came out as wives, sisters, mothers, brides-to-be. But, they had, but they had, they had no there was no sort of profession open to them until quite near the end of the, of the, uh, of the 19th century when they started to come out as nurses, teachers, doctors. And, and a lot of them you know, were very good medical missionaries in, in remote places. But, but they were, of course, a minority. But you, you mention a remarkable example which has been written out of the history books. Uh, British women, led by an enlightened vicerine, Lady Dufferin, establishing the National Association for Supplying Me Female Medical Aid to Indian Women as early as 1885, recognizing the needs of Pardanashin women in Parda, treating, I think the figure you give is four million Indian women by 1914. And why do you think achievements like this have been written out of the history books? Well, when it's a bit of a cliche, but of course, um, history is usually written by the winners. And regimes do not usually um, go out of their way to praise their predecessors. I think with the ICS, it was a bit different because both India and Pakistan modeled their civil services very, very closely on the ICS and also used, for some years, used, used uh, quite a lot of ICS officers uh, in their new place. When, 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 when Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, 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 appointed governors to the four new uh, in, in Pakistan, three of them were ex-ICS officers. Uh, one of them he brought back from retirement in, 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 uh, in St Andrews in Scotland to come and uh, uh, administer the northwest frontier. Uh, and, and Pakistan for long, when they were the Pakistan uh, uh, civil service, when they were recruiting or attempt, attempting new re recruits, uh, they would claim that they were the successors to the finest civil service in the world. I think in other cases, it's, it's, uh, it's quite rare, and this, this case of Arthur Cotton and the 3,000 statues is, is, must be very rare. Uh, uh, and, and in and in British universities, you don't get very far nowadays if you suggest that sometimes some imperialists might have done some, some, some good, which does mean that you know, you're more likely to get a letter signed by 562 academics saying you're talking rubbish. But it does mean people get, get, get written out of the history books. There's a, there was a rather a remarkable family of, of medical missionaries called Holland who ran mobile eye clinics uh, between Sindh and the Punjab in the 1920s, 30s, and a father and two sons. And when they, uh, they won a big international award, which was given to them in Manila in 1960. And the citation said, or claimed that, they had saved the eyesight of 100,000 Indians, which if true is a, is a useful way to spend one's life but I didn't find that in a history book. I mean, one of the other things that comes out in your book is the tension which often emerged between ICS district officers and racist planters who were notorious for kind of mistreating their workers with the district officer usually taking the side of the oppressed workers. Yes, well, the last thing an ICS officer was told uh, by the India office in London before he came out was never hit a native. Um, and if they did, they knew that they would be dismissed. I mean, one, one young ICS officer was instantly sacked uh, because he had, uh, he had forced a Sikh to trim his beard. Um, and the ICS men were, they were educated men and generally fair. And when they saw uneducated British people, planters or soldiers or mistreating an Indian, they, yeah, they did instinctively side with the underdog. I mean, not always to great effect because as you know, alas, uh, 
uh, British juries uh, were very reluctant to convict their own countrymen of, uh, of violent crimes. True. Um, now, the conventional view is that the British in, in, in India went through some kind of cyclical process. So they started out greedy, but culturally curious merchant adventurers with their BBs. Then you get, that gave way to the racist Victorian empire builders um, who were on a mission to civilize. And then finally, you have the more egalitarian, socially committed uh, officers of the 1920s and 30s, a couple of whom you mentioned were even members of the British Communist Party. So is this an oversimplified view of these different phases, and how important is it to get away from those stereotypes? Well, well if you write about individuals, as you know, you, every stereotype is ridiculous. And therefore, one has to generalize and qualify these things. And one could say, yes, um, in the 18th century, the British were, tended to be, the, or there were British who were avaricious fortune hunters. But I could say, yes, in the 19th century, there, there were altruists uh, whose main object, uh, and ignored other things, was to, was to improve the, the lot of, of the Indian people. And yes, in the 20th century, there were some enlightened ICO, politically, or not enlightened, left-wing ICOs officers in, who were socialists and, and, and communists. And yet, you know, the, the, none of these categories are exclusive. But British people came out, British men came out to uh, make money in, 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 uh, all, all the time. And if you, in the 19th and 20th centuries, you might not be able to make a huge fortunes like Clive and his friends among the nabobs, but you could still earn a, 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 um, you know, a very good living as a, a, as a box follower, you know, working for a, a managing agency uh, in, in Bombay or Calcutta or, or, or uh, as an industrialist uh, uh, in Kanpur. Um, Kanpur, was, you know, was, the British like to call it um, the Manchester of the East. And, uh, but considering there are only 450 British people there, it can't have looked very like Manchester. But anyway, they, they, made, they made a good living there. Now, um, final question before I uh, sort of throw it open is, you quote the novelist Paul Scott, saying that India has become an essential, if often unconscious, element of British identity. Uh, a cosmopolitan sense of global entitlement that infuses even the most suburban English surroundings. Uh, uh, how, how far is that still true in Britain today? Well, I don't think we have a cosmopolitan sense of anything nowadays in these days of Brexit. Um, we, we, we've become, we become as insular as, as we were after the Roman legions left Britain. Um, it's... Uh, uh, you know, we, as you know, we have, we have voted to become voluntarily poor, weak, uh, friendless, unimportant. Um, I, I, th I think the British are, British are, are, are I'm not just saying it here, they are generally very pro-Indian, but I don't think it's got much to do with the empire except for a, a few you know, nostalgic uh, elderly people. Um, I don't think many people remember that, uh, or maybe they remember, but they, they don't really care that their grandfather was a, a tea planter in Assam or a, or a jungle waller in, 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 in Kumaon. I mean, in Britain, we like India, well, we like coming here. We like, there's an extraordinary appetite week after week for TV documentaries about Indian railways especially the ones that climb up the Himalaya. Uh, we like watching India playing cricket, especially against us. Uh, and of course, we love Indian food. You know, there are more Indian restaurants in, in Britain than any other type, far more than there are in a uh, British, British type, if there is such a thing as a British restaurant. Um, but I don't think it's got much to do. I think if you, if you say about British identity, is India part of British identity, I would think it was probably less to do with the empire than um, the existence of a large Asian community in, in Britain. Um, I mean, to most people in Britain, 
the idea, the, the thought of empire is of something, you know, it, it doesn't get taught in British schools, people aren't conscious of it uh, unless they have some, uh, unless they've seen a film about it or, uh, but on the whole it's something very far away, very distant. Um, what I, I'm thinking about is that now if you go on Twitter, as I know it's beneath you to do, but I do from time to time. I didn't understand. You, you find the uh, sort of very uh, uh, sort of vocal remain campaigners sort of tweeting stuff about how Britain has a kind of uh, sense of entitlement um, uh, based on its post-imperial sort of, you know, hangover so that Britain thinks it's special in Europe and needs to get special treatment from the EU instead of just accepting what's on offer and staying in the EU. So, I mean, do you think there is anything to that? I mean, Britain having a sense of importance that is possibly, you know, goes, dates back to the empire? Yes, 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 possibly. I, I, think, I think some of the reactionaries in the Tory party are, are, are probably imperialist too. I think it's more that you know, I mean, the great political impulse of the EU uh, was came after the Second World War and among Frenchmen, Italians, Belgians, Dutch, Germans, we don't want to fight each other anymore. We know we spent uh, since you know, 300 years more or less always invading each other. Let's not do this. And of course, the British might think, well, rather smugly, that actually, they, though we were under pressure, they actually there was no foreign foreign invasion. So, so there's that view that maybe British people who know nothing about economics, maybe they think we don't need uh, Europe, and they don't know the actually very important role that Britain has been playing in Brussels, or you know, certainly for the last 30 years. Um, and then they probably also think, I've, I've actually heard people say this, remember 1940, you know, we, we, can, we can do it on our own. We, we'll, we'll muddle through. And that's a, uh, um, that's a pity, because obviously we, we're muddling through, but, but surely we should be more ambitious than just muddling through. Right, well, um, I will invite questions. I'm sure there are lots of cans going to go up, please. Okay, um, are there any mics? Um, are there any mics around? Sorry, I can't see you. Is it possible to lower the lights on? Is it possible to lower the lights on us so we can see the audience? Okay, there's a mic to go there. Uh, hello, my question is regarding the <coughs> ICS officers. Uh, you said they had this sense of fair play. So how they had a sense of fair play because of the education, the ICS officers. Yes, yes. So how did the, uh, the national movement played on them? Because I read somewhere that one of the effective designs of Satyagraha was they made the British feel guilty. So how did the British uh, little people in India re react to Indian national movement? Um, I, 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 I'm afraid I do have hearing um, I, 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 Can I just uh, repeat the question? I think you're saying given the sense of fair play of the ICS officers, how did they react to the nationalist movement? Is that right? Well, I mean, they're, they're not just a, a body of people who, who always, it's a very interesting question of, of, of people who behave in um, one way or another. And, and by the 1920s and 30s, uh, they were much less independent than they had been in the, in the, in, in the Victorian period. They took orders through the telegraph and, and uh, rather than the um, the, the individuals who, who would be stuck in some remote district uh, and, and, and could more or less uh, decide what to do themselves. Uh, I mean, the, the, the ICS politics were nearly always conservative. We, we mentioned that there were some socialists and, and the odd communists in the, in the 20th century. And the trouble is that they had been, they'd been educated you know, at a certain period and then They'd been, after that, they'd been more or less divorced from political trends and British life for 30 years. So they often used to think uh, in, in the same way they, they did as uh, when, they, when they were young. Uh, and we know that there were, uh, a lot of them were sympathetic. In fact, uh, the Viceroy Lord Dufferin in the 1880s welcomed the, uh, the, the creation of the Indian National Congress. Obviously, when the political situation became much more complicated uh, in the 1920s and 30s, 
um, many of them would have been, would have been less sympathetic, uh, perhaps especially in Bengal, uh, uh, where there was also political violence was used. Um, yes, the gentleman there. In today's Britain, we see a remarkable lack of remorse on colonialism <coughs> and the excesses of the Raj, the genocides, the famines, the partition. <coughs> why is that so? With the nostalgic generation gone, why would in today's liberal Britain, Brexit notwithstanding, there be glorification of the Raj? Well, this is, as you know, this isn't, these are not subjects I deal with my book, and I haven't come here to defend this. Uh, the, uh, on, on questions of, of the famines, the idea that uh, a mismanaged famine in Bengal in the middle of the Second World War is comparable, as some people have pointed to Hitler's genocide, really is a completely uh, ahistorical uh, point of view. Uh, I think there, there is quite a lot of remorse, I and mean, certainly British academics today uh, are, are endlessly critical uh, of, of Raj policies uh, of all time. Um, um, do you want to say something? Else? Yes, I just wanted to add that as an uh, Indian historian living in Britain, I find quite the opposite, that there is a prevailing mood of post-colonial guilt. I mean, if you are an academic, as I think uh, David mentioned earlier, uh, you cannot afford to be pro, uh, say anything that is pro-empire. You have to be, you know, firmly anti-colonial. No good came of it. So I think, if anything, you know, there's too much remorse and not enough recognition of the positive side of empire. <coughs> um, <coughs> any more? Uh, the lady, yes. When, uh, during the 300 years or 250 years, did this image of the British um, administrator in India being comparable to a Roman tribune being posted in 280 to Britain, that seems to be a recurring theme in the writings of many people, of course, best exemplified in Kipling. But when does this start and how did this evolve? This Roman uh, fascination with being uh, kind of uh, uh, trying to imitate what the Romans did. Yeah, well, that's very, very interesting. In the, I, I think it was completely absent in the 18th century uh, until at the end, because um, you, know, the, the, you know, the early civil servants of the East End Company were merchants and traders and accountants, and, and they were more interested in that than, than it's, I think, when Lord Wellesley, uh, the, the brother of the future Duke of Wellington, came out as Governor General in the 1790s, I think he specifically said, I want you to, to, be, to be like Romans. And by then, Lord Cornwallis, the Governor General, had said, you know, they, they've got to live off their professional salaries. They can't indulge in trade. So then the idea became that they were, they were, they were Roman tribunes. And, and I think this, you know, more or less lasted uh, forever, the idea. Because the, the British also had this um, uh, conceit, it was said that, sorry, they were like, uh, you know, their imperialism was partly like the Greeks and partly like the Romans. And it was Greek uh, in what were known then as the white dominions, where you would have democracy like the Greeks did. But in Africa and Asia, uh, they had to be like Romans, you know, enlightened people, uh, but no, but no nonsense about democracy. I think the, the lady in the second row, would we, did you have your hand up? Uh, no? Oh, there is a, someone. Yeah. Uh, what are the roots of this uh, notion of fair play uh, commonly associated with the British? What are the philosophical or intellectual roots of this association? Gosh, what a wonderful question. It it's, um, deserves several seminars. Uh, I can't remember where it started. Uh, but it's obviously been mythical in many ways. Uh, we always think now, oh, the old days of, the old days of cricket, uh, when everything was fair play. But actually, it, it's not true. There are numerous instances of um, 
or not ball tampering. That's a that's a new one. But of other of uh, other ways of uh, unfair play and bad umpiring in cricket in the past. Uh, I'm not sure where. Uh, I mean, it, it is been it is something that, that, as you say, people always talk about. Oh, fair play, support for the underdog, uh, and one likes to think it's there, but maybe it's. It, 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 Maybe it's been exaggerated. Do you have any ideas on that, where fair play might come from? Um, well, I, th I think um, Shakespeare, but also uh, British political philosophers like John Locke and, and uh, Hume and the, the utilitarian... Oh, well, liberty yeah. to hew an individual, yes. individual liberty, but yeah. is fair play in that? Um, yes, I think the idea of, of some kind of uh, natural justice and the state being accountable but it's some sort of social contract yes yeah no i agree with that so i was thinking fair play is just a, yes okay but i think we are going to have Wait. to leave it there yes sir